Um, I started Exemplary Consultants to help companies with anything that has to do with HR and talent acquisition. So what I do is help people to disrupt how they've been doing HR for the last 10 to 20 years. So if your firm is into hiring people with progressive leadership experience, you know, who have degrees in HR, I'm not your gal. But if you want to like kill your annual performance review and do agile performance methodology and things like that, then definitely, you know, holler at me and I'll be happy to help. Also, if your recruiting team is just simply mostly doing stuff behind the desk, then also hit me up because I can help your team think outside the box and find out how if 72% of all roles industry-wide are filled by networking and referral, how much time should you be spending on LinkedIn? Oops, sorry, I said that name, but, you know, so I'm happy to help. Uh, okay, so Greta Thunberg. Ring a bell to anybody? Okay, so she made herself a meme of how dare you. But she also changed up how everybody started having attention now to climate change. And she has taken the world by storm. She's 16 years old, but here's what she had to do. She had to address something. She has a diagnosis that she received four years ago. You know what that is? It's Asperger's syndrome. So what is Asperger? Well, first of all, it's named for a guy named Hans Asperger, who back in the 1940s found that there was a connection between people who had difficulties with verbal and nonverbal communication. And so um, I'm just going to read here. There's a, also a guy named Tony Atwood, who's a world authority on Asperger's, and he said that people diagnosed are usually renowned for being direct, speaking their mind, being honest, and being determined, and have a strong sense of social justice. And I will tell you that the people that I know who have Asperger's, they're all adults now, uh, that was, is very descriptive. Um, I have a relative, you know, that... Um, that got that diagnosis uh, when he was um, in his teens. His parents had taken him everywhere to try to find out what it was because back in the 1990s, people didn't even really know about autism back then. You know, and I just think, wow, in 20 years, look how far we've come. How many people here know somebody who has Asperger's or knows that they have a kid who has Asperger's or a neighbor who has Asperger's or any autism spectrum disorder? Yep, so there's a lot of people now, we just, it's just become a thing. In fact, they're all like, oh, it's because of red dye, it's because of all these things, but at the end of the day, we are learning how people function differently. You know how there are different learning styles? You know, people who are auditory learners, you know, they, they learn by hearing, the kinesthetic, people who learn by, you know, hands-on, you know, and the visual learners, people who really like looking at that blackboard, you know, so, it's the same way with how we're all wired differently. And so just because we're wired differently doesn't make us really different in terms of what we can bring to the table. So you know that Time Magazine decided to award Greta Thunberg with uh, Time Magazine's Person of the Year. So how many would, um, would like to hire a person like that who makes Time Magazine Person of the Year? Would you like someone like that working in your organization? But how many are in organizations where you would probably have ruled her out for any number of reasons that you can't identify, but it's because you don't understand her. And Pete, what we don't understand, we're afraid of. You know, it's just, it's just that way. I think about the parents of this particular relative. They just didn't have a clue once that diagnosis came in. Well, then what do you do from there? Okay, so I want to talk about the Asperger's, then I want to talk about the autism spectrum of disorders, and then I want to talk about it in terms of how does that affect us, you know, overall with diversity and inclusion here for our hiring needs. So first of all, what is it? Well, uh, back in 2013, they decided that there were many different uh, parts of um, disorders that all they've decided to lump under just simply autism spectrum disorders. And so, it usually involves difficulty with social interactions. 
First and foremost, the social interactions are difficult because there are not social cues that have been processed. For example, one might give you intense eye contact and just laser focused and you're all of a sudden feeling uncomfortable. And then there will be those that just, they're talking to you, but they're not giving you any eye contact. And so that doesn't mean that they're socially inept. They're just, they just communicate differently. And so um, the restricted interests, here's the thing that's really, really cool. So the, um, there's one guy that I know, he became like the person we always talk to about the weather. Why? Because that was the one subject he was absolutely the subject matter expert in. He knew everything about wind velocities and he could predict what would happen in these tornadoes and storms because he understood the patterns, you know, from years of having these kinds of disasters and it was just extraordinary. So people that have that kind of narrow interest become like the SMEs. They have the deep and wide. The desire for sameness means that if there is a job that has to do with um, bookkeeping and numbers or data entry or stocking or coding or something that's going to be similar every single day, that it's going to be pretty much the same type of thing. There will be some variations, but it's the same type of thing, having repetitive um, tasks to do. That is where somebody with Asperger's would simply thrive. And you know what? They would take that job that you would have for them, and they'd, they'd get it on steroids. So this particular relative um, saw that the family kept throwing things into this pantry down in their basement, and within 10 minutes would have everything looking like a display shelf at Whole Foods. It was just extraordinary. That would, if I were to go down there and try to do that, it would have taken me an hour, right? But this particular individual, you know, just had that ability to um, focus on that. So same thing with my friend's daughter. She works at a grocery store. And it's really the perfect job for her because she has the things that she does every day. She had to branch out where they put her in one department. Then they had to try to slowly integrate her into another department. And a number of years later, she is thriving as their best employee because she's dependable, she brings her you know, focus and her strength you know, to the job every single day, and they, they absolutely love her there. So the strengths can include that remo remarkable focus and persistence. I hired a young man um, on a marketing campaign that I had to do where we had to distribute 3,000 jars of apple butter to these neighborhoods for a realtor, and he was meticulous about making sure that those um, labels that went on the tops of the um, jars, they were absolutely picture perfect, you know, and, and he didn't stop, you know, it's like he just kept on going until the job was done. At one point, it's like, you can go home now. <laughs> I'm sure your family misses you, but, you know, but that was where it was, it wasn't done until he was done. So that attention to detail makes any person desirable. I mean, wouldn't we want to have Someone who could have focus, who could have the ability to get things done and pays attention to those details. Have you ever read those resumes that say, oh, detail-oriented, right? And they have typos in their resume and you're thinking, yeah, swipe left. So, okay, so then some of the challenges can include these things and the reason why I think we need to look at this in the context of this day is that how are we designing the interview process to be inclusive of people, not just people with Asperger's, but people who may have sensitivities to lights and sounds and tastes. Are we, are we having panel interviews for people who are like introverts, for example? Okay, I know this sounds crazy because I, I portray myself and I'm pretty extroverted in my portrayal here, but um, I definitely am uh, tested out as being introverted because after something like this, I just want to curl up in a ball for the next day and not talk to anybody. So here's the thing. Um, panel interviews are no good for people who are introverted. Panel interviews are not good for people with autism spectrum disorders. It's just too much distraction. So how are we not just really trying to get more one-on-ones in, in more quiet locations and the ability to let people Take time to answer, because if you ask a question to someone who is introverted, 
they're going to sit and think a, a bit to try to respond because they've got several different things going on. So you need to just wait patiently and don't, don't be doing this, you know? And same thing with people who have Asperger's. Same thing with people who are autistic. They are noticing when you're looking up at the clock or you're kind of, when, when, when your face kind of glazes over. So here's where your biases have to just be left at the door before you walk into that room. You have to really look at yourself and say, okay, I'm not comfortable with talking to this person because I didn't grow up talking to people who had these issues. So I don't know what to do. Well, that doesn't mean you don't get to learn now. We all need to really stretch ourselves and just get outside of our own boxes and our own comfort zones and learn what does it mean to relate to people. So don't raise your hand, but if you are here and your social group consists of people in your age group, people who have the same political persuasion, people who are in your same, who have your same religious beliefs, people who are in your same ethnic groups. If those are your only people in your social circles, how are you going to grow? How are you going to change? How are you going to become tolerant of others and their differences? How are you going to become accepting of people's differences? And then how do you then transition to celebrating the differences that we all have? So I would challenge you to find a meetup group that does knitting if you're into gaming or just something where you can actually find people who are different than you. Because you know what? The more you hang out with people who are different from you, you will learn how to be a way better recruiter. So um, I would say this last one, the anxiety and depression. Raise your hand if you've never had an anxious thought or never had a depressing thought in your life. We've all been there. We've all walked, you know, in that. Whether or not it was a diagnosis or not, we've all been there. So we should at least have that empathy in common. So even though that diagnosis is no longer being used, people still who are di um, diagnosed with it strongly identify with the term. So it's unlike what we just heard that on neurodiverse, that people don't really like that. Well, people who had this sort of embrace that as, you know, a definition of who they are. So one thing that I have found amongst the adult friends that I have that are um, with that diagnosis, they tend to overcome challenges and strengths. So if you were to just kind of Google it, like let's say you're going to set up an interview with Greta and you want to kind of learn about Asperger's so that you can kind of get up to snuff and figure out what you can and can't do, you're going to read things that aren't true. There are, for example, there was the school of thought that if you were diagnosed as being bipolar, you will always be bipolar. And guess what? That isn't true. There are so many people who've learned to retrain their brains, and they are no longer bipolar. So they're no longer on medication. Same thing with Asperger's. This particular um, person that I have been talking about, um, in his youth, would have to have, like if there were a meal, like if his mom had made him a meal, and it had these five things that went with that meal, that meal had to have those same five things in that same order on the plate every single time or there was a meltdown. They had a really hard time being able to figure out what to do about that. And the psychiatrist who had diagnosed him said, that's the way he will always be. Well, that young man is now, you know, much older um, and eats sushi and Chipotle, and all of these other different things that would, it was just like a mystery, a total mystery. And here's the other thing. I know that you've probably watched, I forget what the name of that program was on TV, but it featured some guy who had Asperger's. And I would say that a lot of how he presented in that particular show was, was fairly accurate. But the other thing, too, is that they don't get jokes. And my, I, I actually hit up my girlfriend last night and said, okay, your daughter, when she had been interviewing, what were some of the biggest drawbacks with the interviewers? And it's that she didn't understand joking, and they thought she was rude, and they didn't let her go to the next level. And so that's where, if you make a joke and somebody just has a flat affect and they're not laughing, they probably just didn't get your joke. Doesn't mean you're not funny, it just means they didn't get the joke, no harm, no foul, move to the next thing, but don't judge them for the fact that they didn't get the joke. So this young man actually would be in social settings where people would tell jokes and just have like no reaction until one day I remembered we were all at this, um, this young man's 
house and his father told a joke and a few seconds after everybody left, you could see a light bulb go off on his face and he started laughing. And I thought, he just got that joke. And then, you know, a few weeks later, met up with them again. And it's not only did this young man start getting jokes, actually at the same time that everybody got the joke, that person started being able to tell jokes years later. So never think that just because somebody presents a certain way, like when you're interviewing them, that they won't change and grow when they're in-house. You know, they're not, don't, don't treat people with rigid definitions because, you know, if like maybe let's say two weeks ago, I didn't feel well and I was really depressed and you interviewed me on that day that I was really depressed, I would probably not have the energy that I have right now, even with coffee, I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to present with much energy. And then the thing about it is that you would form an opinion about me based on my behavior in that hour. Is that a way that we really want to consider people? How they behave in one hour on one day, whether they have Asperger's or autism or they're just you and me, right? Is that how we want to really be evaluated for our suitability for a role? I think we really need to think that out. So um, at the moment, 50,000 people per year are going to enter adulthood you know, with an autism spectrum disorder. So what does that mean to us who are recruiting? Especially when it comes to college recruitment. I really feel like we need to be tapping into groups on college campuses because they do have groups. You know, the, the Autism Speaks is a really great organization and they have organized groups on campus. So if we want to be able to learn from people with autism, that's who we want to learn from. If we want to recruit them, we need to ask them, how is our, this is our recruiting process. How is this inhibiting you from applying for a job? If we have you in for an interview, what are things that would really upset you if you came into this situation? And what are things that would make you feel more comfortable in a situation? So I think that the intel that we need to gather are from people to make sure that we are being inclusive in our entire hiring process. But primarily when it comes to those in-house interviews, I think that the most people that I have seen that actually um, are saying that they have these things that, okay, well, we have online, you know, where you can call this number and you can have, you know, you can do this talk to text thing where the, it can be filled out. It's like, it's great to have all that up front, but then I, this is, I know this is one of the cringiest things I have ever read in my life, but there was a guy who showed up for a tech interview at this company and it was in an older part of Oakland, I think it was, and he was in a wheelchair. And the people who had interviewed him and called him in had not known that information. The interview was in on the second story of a walk-up. Do you know what those people decided to do? They came up with the brilliant idea that four of them would carry him in his wheelchair up to the second floor. Please don't let that happen in your orgs. I mean, that seriously was the, one of the sad, I actually teared up when I read that. I thought, I can't even, I can't, I can't even. So make sure that you are doing everything that you can to make your environments in your places as inclusive. Re, you know, think about all of the ways that people would need to access, be able to be comfortable and to exit gracefully. Just make sure you're doing that for all people, but also specifically get the input of people whose um, senses might not be working in the same way that ours are. So just to recap about autism spectrum disorders, really it's just persistent def deficits in social communication social and social interaction across multiple contexts. So you think about like the software developer, you know, the person who codes in their parents' basement and just they just knock it out of the ballpark, right? Well, they may not be the ones who are going to play well with others, but you give them that more isolated environment and let them do their thing and they are going to produce every single time. You know, you make them come to sit in an open space and, the, and you want them to sit side by side, you know, at a table with other people. It's like whatever it is that you think you're doing to build team cohesiveness needs to just go. You just need to start over and rethink what you're doing and say, why are we requiring this of all people? You know, it doesn't, everybody doesn't need to be sitting at some big open table, you know, with these ceilings that look like they're in a warehouse or a factory or something, 
they're not, not everybody's going to thrive in an environment like that. And then the restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities, leverage the hell out of that because you'll be able to take people who have that focus, they have that drive. They've also found that most people have an above um, average IQ. These are really intelligent people. A lot of geniuses have this, and you probably don't even know that because they haven't self-disclosed. And that's another thing, too. Don't come out and ask people if they have this. It's almost like, just don't. You know, it's like asking somebody, oh, are you pregnant? You know, to say, oh, so, you know, you see something, don't, don't, don't become their psychiatrist and, and diagnose them. It's like, no, we don't ask. If, if they want to identify, that's one thing, but don't make people uncomfortable by asking them questions that would make them think that, oh, you think I have this. <laughs> and it's like, don't out them. You know, it's like, let them out themselves to you. So um, when we think about what makes a company diverse, my very dear friend, Torin Ellis, is somebody who I call Mr. Diversity and Inclusion. I have the greatest respect for this individual. He has influenced the way that I think about everything in life. And he challenges me on a regular basis. So I told him that I just found out before getting on the train that I was going to come up and do this. So I said, what actually makes a company diverse? And he said, diversity is about any person who is underrepresented you know, in the workforce. And I just thought that that was really lovely because it doesn't identify you know, the socioeconomic aspects. It doesn't um, identify biology, but it really means have you had this, or have, has this person been in a situation where they're not being included? And I can tell you that um, just because someone didn't finish a degree does not make them unhirable. So even if you are doing college recruiting and you're reaching out to juniors or you're reaching out to people who are underclassmen or something, they may not finish, okay? Keep them in your pipeline because if you, if, if you engage with them and you really think that they would be great once they graduate, if they don't graduate, they may still be great. So I would like for you to consider all students, not just the ones who graduate, but all students all together. So I think that inclusion is all about embracing belonging. And anybody that you come in contact that you're recruiting should feel like they could belong in your organization. You're not finding ways to exclude them. You're finding ways to rule them in. So I think we need to just retrain our brains, every day challenge ourselves about our biases. And I can tell you, when you look in the mirror, you're going to see a certain image. I can tell you that if my daughter looks at me, she's going to see something totally different. My neighbor's going to see something different. I need other people to tell me what I look like because I can't assess myself. So get trusted people, the people that you know who are going to say, oh, man, that, that shirt really looks bad on you. To get that person you know, to challenge you because you want to be able to think outside the box. And then find new sources you know, for candidates. If you've been fishing in the same ponds, I'm sorry, trying to change this up. There are so many different groups and so many different organizations that we can tap into. And I think that we can really up our game if we do that. So I have the amazing privilege of having just met um, last night the panelists that are going to be coming up now. And I will say that I've already learned from them just by looking at the questions you know, that they've submitted. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm already going to learn a lot from these people. So um, if you could just uh, join me in welp welcoming the next panel, and I am going to have them introduce themselves. Here we go, excuse me. So instead of me yabbering about them, I just sort of uh, sent them some questions that I wanted them to answer when they introduced themselves. And so, um, so Jonathan, if you want to go first, we'll just work our way from here on down. That would be awesome. All right. Thank you. Really excited to be here today. Uh, my name is John Kestenbaum. I'm the co-founder, uh, managing director of an organization called Talent Tech Labs. Uh, under your seats, you might see a, a little green playbook that we uh, put together to kind of explain to you how to leverage technology to hire diverse talent. Uh, that's what we do. That's our expertise is uh, understanding how technology can make an impact on uh, solving talent acquisition business problems. And we uh, deliver that expertise through a, a membership. Oh, wait. Jonathan, 
Why do you love what you do? Oh, man. Um, so I, I love the people that I get to work with um, in town acquisition. So uh, everyone really cares about making a difference, helping people. So you generally are working with nice, thoughtful people. Um, and, and personally, I'm passionate about um, how we can leverage technology to make our lives more efficient. So I get to do it every day. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Janine Truitt, Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations LC. It's my own multidisciplinary consulting firm where I focus on workforce planning, digital transformation, um, wellness, uh, tech advisory, just to name a few things. In the scope of all of those things, my focus really is on human transformation. So how do we meet the humans that we are every day? How do companies meet the humans that we are every day? through the work that people choose to align themselves with. So through those modalities, that's where I work. For 15 years, I've been heavily involved in the disability community, um, being on different boards like the Viscardi Center, working with organizations like United Way, um, another organization called Free, just really trying to be an advocate and create pathways in the workplace for people that are differently abled, um, in a lot of different ways and trying to bridge that gap. And Janine, what do you love about what you do? What I love about what I do is that I was able to build something from the ground up. So I was an HR practitioner for many years. I got really tired of being beholden to a certain way of being an HR practitioner and feeling like I was constantly going against the grain in the organizations that I joined. And when I recognized, and to Ken's earlier point, had advocates that saw something in me that I thought I had to put off 20 plus years because um, talent think wasn't going to happen until my husband retired, who's also exiting, but that's, a, <laughs> that's separate. Um, <laughs> so the idea that I'm able to really come up with fresh and innovative ideas um, and work with people that are ready to do this work and, and improve humanity, I think, is my favorite part. <laughs> Not a problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Lois Barth, and I'm principal of LBCC, Lois Barth Coaching and Consulting. And uh, lucky for me, I'm an ideation junkie. I feel like another day, another idea. And so I get to do a lot of different things. I'm a human development expert, motivational speaker, coach, and author of Courage to Sparkle. Because my motto is, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that bling. <laughs> and I... I feel that way about human beings, right? That, that we all sparkle when we shine bright, when we share our gifts, and when we make a difference in the world. And that, to me, is what I love about diversity, that when we have a diverse culture of different sexual orientation, age, gender, body type, learning, learning differences, that's when the culture becomes rich. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we spend, what, $2,500 for a studio that's the size of like an amoeba's shoebox? Because every five blocks, there's another language you hear. In Manhattan, and it's the same thing in the work culture. So what I do is I bring in, I'm, I do motivational speaking a lot for women in male-dominated industries, which is about 98% of most industries, and I also do a lot of B2B coaching executive being brought into organizations to help with the mid and senior level executives, what are their vision and how do we up-level the team both in leadership and uh, responsibility. And what do I love about my work is um, I've never had any children, none that I know of, and uh, <laughs> so I really feel like I'm a midwife for people's dreams, both B2B and B2C. Nothing makes me feel better than knowing that with my work as a, as a team, with my clients, whether it's B2B, B2C, groups or individuals, that they are moving towards their goals and their visions. And they're not only making a difference in their life, because they're also making a difference in everyone else's and in the culture. So to me, it's like, you know, I feel like if I won Powerball, I would still be doing what I'm doing, you know. And I'd fire myself from the things I don't like doing. So I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Kessa Ward, and I am the Senior Director of Talent Acquisition at Phenom People. And my role is to, and our mission of our company is to find a billion people the right job, no matter what disability, what gender, uh, race that the individual is. And 
what I love about my job is a little bit different than her. Her, her uh, she has no children. I feel like I have a million children at my company, and I'm responsible for every single one of them. And I tackle all of the experiences throughout the talent life cycle. So that's candidate experience, recruiter experience, hiring manager experience. And then the last experience is the C-level experience. So anything that has to do with those experiences as they come in the door or even before they get there is really under my umbrella. And that's what I love about my job, making those unique. So I'm like the Starbucks barista, <laughs> making sure that everyone is unique and different. So Awesome. Okay, so I think that some of these questions have really stimulated me. I have been anxiously awaiting to hear the answers. So Janine, if you could get us started with... Um, what do you think that neurodiversity and disability hiring continues to be a challenge for, more, for many employers? Ooh. Um, if we start with neurodiversity, for instance, the, the process of cognition and the process of thinking is an internal sort of thing. It's not something that we can see. Uh, which is why it's been a problem for psychologists and psychiatrists for so many years. It's been this ongoing battle since I was in school for psychology as to whether, you know, thinking is a thing because we can't see it. It's not tangible, right? Um, and then when I couple that with the years that I've worked with organizations really trying to move the needle ahead in terms of leveling the playing ground for differently able people, whether neurodiverse or not, um, the chief thing that I've heard through the years is it scares them. They, they don't really know what to do with a person that is visibly disabled or shows a, a behavior or a deficit that they're not used to. And why is that the case? Because everything we have, everything we know is geared towards a neurotypical um, spectrum, right? It, and, and who made that up anyhow, right? Um, and so everything we do from there is going to be biased. It's going to be skewed because we're looking for a certain pedigree in every person that we meet, regardless of what we put in our job descriptions and our job postings. It's like we've created some sort of um, bionic human that we think is going to be good in a role. And all, far be it that we get somebody in a wheelchair, or far be it that we get somebody with Asperger's or a learning deficit or somebody like myself who happens to be introverted. So I don't have Asperger's at all. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a disabled person. There are some jokes that are just not funny to me. So if you said it to me in an interview, I'm probably not going to laugh because I'm also blunt, right? <laughs> but I will turn your company out. I'd like to think I'm pretty smart, right? But I would have lost pretty early in the game just based on some really kind of neurotypical things. And so I think it continues to be a challenge because in a lot of ways we don't want to be challenged with something that's different. And this is just another peg along the diversity spectrum of yet another group of people that we've got to pander to and why, you know? And so it's a challenge, um, but it's a good challenge and it's one that I hope will open up the ground for us to really start looking at diversity from a human perspective um, because we all are neurodiverse. Yes, right now, currently, the operational definition speaks to a specific group of um, deficits and things like that, but I guarantee you on any given day, I'm as bright as they can be and sometimes not that bright, and I'm sure you all can attest, <laughs> depending on those things. So the hope is to really level the playing ground so that it is less about being neurotypical and more about the diversity of thought. Right. So then when we think about this, okay, well, where does it all start? It really doesn't start with us, the recruiters, does it? It really starts with um, the people who are managing it. Oh, the people who are managing recruitment. So. Um, Kay says, should talent advisors or recruiters who are at the forefront of hiring, should they have diversity discussions with hiring managers? Hello? What do you guys think? <laughs> you guys are too quiet, so I wanted someone from the audience. Do you, I mean, we're all recruiters, right? And in the room, well, now we've got to go back and say, okay, recruiters, now you've got to talk to your hiring managers about diversity, right? They've already, we've given them tactics along the way to work with our hiring managers, we hear something else. What do we think before I answer? I will share with you the EEOC statistics say that 
74% of managers are white males, and then 74% are in HR are women. So we're already at a negative bias there, I guess. But what do you think? Should we now have to talk with our hiring managers about diversity? Everyone thinks yes. I agree. I think we're, we're at the forefront as recruiters, right? So when you think about how we can make a change, and we've talked about that a lot today, um, just being able to have these conversations openly with our hiring managers about their teams, because we know that the best relationships that are successful in your organizations are the ones where recruiter and hiring manager are really you know, connected well. 67% of Glassdoor reviews say that employees want to join a diverse organization, right? That's a big percentage. So we have to share these uh, statistics with our hiring managers and make sure that they are aware of this and not take it as a disadvantage, but really start to change and make it more of an advantage. So, Can I add to that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I've had the sad privilege of demoing, you know, thousands of talent acquisition technology solutions um, and, and kind of watching how organizations uh, with really thoughtful um, strategic approaches to diversity hiring, um, leverage those tools. Uh, I watch everything fall short at the hiring manager, uh, always, every time. doesn't matter what you do, it always falls short at the hiring manager. And you have to be really sensitive to um, how you solve that problem because legally you can't incentivize them to hire diverse talent, right? Um, and so we've seen some pretty interesting technology um, that kind of tracks anonymously um, these different teams and how um, you know how they're hiring, if they're hiring diverse talent um, at the hiring manager level, so you can start to assess you know each individual team and how to solve those problems in those those problem areas. Uh, but I think it always falls short on the hiring manager, and definitely need to step in. So, who here has a story that they want to share about something that is being successfully done in your company? in terms of getting hiring managers on board. Hi there, uh, my name is Joe. I work for Deutsche Bank on the campus recruitment team. Um, a successful strategy that we have appointed for getting hiring managers to think more about diversity is we approach it by division. And within each division, we appoint senior leaders who act as diversity champions who champion all forms of diversity and inclusion and multiple different perspectives and help influence the hiring managers. So my question is, so you talk about on the hiring man the recruiting side and the hiring manager side. I'm curious as you think about what colleges are doing to prepare students to make the most of their own diversity and show up prepared to have an interesting conversation and engage at, in a way of, Here's what I bring to the table. What are you seeing that's working on college campuses to allow students to make the most of what they're bringing? Yeah, could you repeat the questions? Thanks. <laughs> How or what are colleges doing to prepare students to understand some of their differences and what that can mean in the workforce? And we talked a little bit earlier about veterans, we work with athletes, we talk about uh, neurodiversity, and all of those yes are different and they bring some unique strengths to the table. So I'm curious if folks are seeing some positive things that are happening on college campuses to prepare students to show up and talk about these things in a really positive way in terms of both understanding them and also knowing what they bring to an employer. If not, I think that's a great business. Um, I, I think the university, a great business. and I'd love to hear schools if anyone has them. I think where the universities, where the Office of Diversity has a close tie with the career centers, you'll start seeing successes, but they're very separate. Yeah. Data does not flow easily between the two. And so I think if you put 25 career center directors up here, their frustration is, they don't know the data to know the students to help support them in a way that makes sense to the probably the student sometimes. But I, I know there's schools that are starting to break the mold. I just don't know the names. But I. Is it? So I guess yeah. Sure. At George Mason no. University, every semester in their college to career course, 
And I will say that that instructor is on point for making sure he brings people from the outside to challenge up how those students in that one semester are thinking about what the workforce is going to be like and what that means to them you know, as an individual, but also for their other classmates. He makes sure that they engage. So I think that if, they, if other colleges would do that and hire the right professor, and this is an adjunct professor who does this, he's really making progress every single semester. And these kids still stay in touch with me long after they've graduated from George Mason to you know, continue to engage. And a lot of it has to do about that topic, about I'm in this team and I don't know what to do. It's like, OK, thanks for asking. Yeah, you know what? I just have to make a comment because it's schools aren't even doing enough to teach their students about what kind of jobs they can get when they get out with the majors that they have. And the majors have become so minute. And uh, I work a lot just very, because I'm passionate about it with young people. And my kids have all recently, I still have one in college and a couple that have been through it. And so all their friends I talk to, I try to coach. And it's, it, it would be amazing if we could help them. Um, but I think it's so much more important for the leadership to open that up for these kids who don't have a lot of experiences and are going to be the last ones to tell you that I have Asperger's because they want a job. You know. I was going to say my experience has been a lot of the career centers are underfunded and under-resourced and there isn't enough of a connect between industry and them. Uh, I'm surprised oftentimes at some of the things that they're still peddling through um, the career centers. And so I think it goes back to some points made earlier. We really need to be thinking about how we bridge that gap, really creating grassroots movements in some regard in terms of going back to the schools. Like something I've been really passionate about for my entire career is affecting curriculum going back and, and looking at a curriculum and saying, how well does this actually match up with the kind of person that we would hire? I've created my own academies for um, kids that are in schools to help them understand exactly how they'll have to present in the workforce and ran it with like other professional friends of mine, like literally out of their houses during a break. So, I mean, it's like those sort of movements that we need to start to wrap our heads around. We have the expertise. There's a deficit. How do we start to bridge those gaps? Can I, can I just add to that? I, I agree, by the way. I think universities are challenged to deliver curriculum in and of itself. This is I mentioned earlier, I personally do that in my team. We go to campus. We talk about this issue to all students, the importance of DNI and inclusive leadership and bias. So I, frankly, I put the challenge out to all. There's a lot of great organizations in this room. Why don't you go to your campuses and why don't you talk about this issue and how, say how important it is to your organization and challenge all the students. By the way, not just the black and Latino and Pan-Asian students, all the students on that campus or in the business school, wherever you recruit from, around why it matters to you. Because what I found is that students, especially if they're looking to get an opportunity, sometimes they do listen to employers. So my, my thing is, why don't we do it? I just wanted to add something to that. Can I be heard? Oh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's really more of, to, to um, dovetail what Ken said, it's more of a kind of a visionary aspirational. But as a coach, like one of the things I do is help people close the gap between knowing and doing. And one of the things I see, especially in my interview coaching with um, young people at the early part of their career, they have these great educations, but they have no skills around applicability, accountability, implementation. And I, I really think more and more if there was an initiative, and that could be really a, a brass ring for colleges to individuate themselves, is to have curriculum that's designed in the trenches. I mean, that's why there's so many young entrepreneurs that are opting not to go to college, and they're looking at, like, they want to be in the trenches every day doing it. It's, it's a much more experiential generation. And if colleges can leverage that and also recruitment start writing articles about the importance of that in colleges, and that's an individuating factor in a college, I think that would make a huge difference and we would start to shift that needle. So. Yeah, thank you, Lois. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone, I'm Greg. I run my own advisory firm here in Manhattan and 
our industry is predominantly white males and I cringe going to events at night because there is zero diversity and it's the same guys always drinking at the bar. I love my industry, we do a lot of good, but there's definitely that aspect. And I started my own company because I wanted to create culture, change the culture. How, on the other side of the spectrum, how do you, I guess, uh, get a, uh, how do you uh, connect everybody? So once you do the recruiting, I guess there's a second aspect of it. Is it through corporate wellness programs to bring everyone together? How do you get everybody in sync with each other? Does that make sense? So there's... I guess, yeah. where's the inclusion part? How do you execute right. on the inclusion? Um, so there, there's a few different things, I think. Um, the first thing is really treating every person that walks into your organization as an individual, which HR people tend to hate. <laughs> Because it's like, what? More work? I've got to get to know every single person. But there's this growing concept now in our industry about meaningful moments, right? Meaning that um, if I understand you, if I understand what's important to you, then I can provide meaningful experiences, moments, opportunities, um, upward mobility or lateral mobility, whatever that is, so that you always feel included in the environment or you feel like what you bring to the table is valuable. So that's one prong to it. The other prong, in so far as we're talking about inclusion, is how do people assimilate into their environments? And in order for you to properly assimilate people, you have to understand what you're dealing with. So like at the CEO level, when we build a business, right? You've built one, I've built one. There's a mission, there's a vision. That's like the lofty you know, ideal of what we'd like the business to be, right? But as we start to get beyond a certain number, of people that starts to get a little diluted or it starts to transmute, if you will. And then you have a, you have the issue of, of what I tell my clients is a cultural subcultural um, dynamic, right? So at the cultural level, we may have all altruistic views about how we want things to do. We want everybody to come here and feel accepted. If we're not careful and we don't have good checks and balances at the subcultural level, then we get ourselves into issues because now we've got all these individuals that we've elevated to leadership positions that are creating these different ecosystems within the ecosystem. Some of them may play nice and be really inclusive. Some of them may be toxic. And those will be the ones where you're gonna see a lot of attrition, um, perhaps litigation um, and things of that nature. So I think it's just really important to be honest with yourself, um, especially if you're up there about what is that connectivity between what we're saying we are and what's actually happening on the ground. And if there are things happening on the ground, no harm, no foul. Let's talk about it, let's identify it, let's fix it so that there is not that dissonance um, between what we intended and what we're actually doing. Does that answer your question? Well, one w word that you said that I, out of all the words that I wanted to zero in on is the word assimilate. In the phone call that I was in for the other panel, it was brought up that the word should be acclimate. And that was revolutionary to me to hear you all say that on that call, that we, it's not about assimilating people, but it's about acclimating people. And I thought, wow, we, this is the type of thing that I feel like can really change us up is even when we look at terminology, do we really want people assimilating or do we want them acclimating? So I really wanted to bring that up. And as you were talking about, you know, getting people, you know, to the table and all these sort of things, I was thinking, well, Lois, uh, what should be in our messaging, you know, to be able to attract and retain people who have differences? Yes, that's a really great question. I love, um, I love curiosity, and that's what's so compelling about animals and children is that they're wildly curious, and then we lose that after a certain point. And so I feel that having a cohesivity in your message, walking your talk, not just checking off the boxes, have you sponsored events for groups with differences? What about some of your articles on LinkedIn? Maybe you didn't write a post, but maybe you comment on a post. Um, is a mission statement around differences really being played out? And, and how is that, are you walking your talk, everything from messaging, social media imprint, the type of questions you're asking in an interview, is that all leading up so that people with differences don't say, oh, yeah, and they're just checking off the boxes? And, of course, do you have the metrics to prove it? I think that's really important. I, I just want to, I feel the need to share this story. Uh, a colleague of mine worked with Jim Henson. And in Jim Henson's organization, that there was no bad idea. 
And if you gave a really bad idea, it was an inside joke, he would tap a pencil and go, hmm, interesting. And he would move on. And they were back in the powder room, locker room, whatever, saying, oh, boy, that, that idea. But it sent a message that no idea was wrong and every idea was embraced. And I think that's such an important part with differences because people with differences have different ideas, they have different questions, they have different observations. And by leading with curiosity and making sure that everything in your, you know, your, your brand is cohesive with that, that invites people with differences. So I love curiosity because it kind of opens us up to being somewhat accepting or at a minimum tolerant of different viewpoints. But I think what we're really, the, the North Star for me is psychological safety, right? It's this ability to show up exactly as I am, Janine Truitt, to your organization with all my light and all my dark qualities and you accept that that is of value to your organization. So if I raise an idea, it'll be heard. If I say something that's important to me, whether or not everybody else in the room agrees with it, it'll be heard and accepted as such. I think that is a universal thing. It's not even a race, color, creed thing. We all want to be heard. We all want to be valued. We all want to do good work. Um, and so I think it's a good time to be talking about and thinking about how psychologically safe is it for an employee to show up to your organization today and, and really embody the fullness of who they are? So I may not be a digital native, but I really love the tech that it has been coming out and how, you know, helping to enhance how we do what we do better. And Jonathan, I love that you do a 1,000 demos a month or whatever it is that you do because you're very, very, very adept at knowing the different types of tools you know, that can um, be used to help recruiters to identify diverse candidates. So can you tell us about what are some of the advantages that you've seen and then what are some of the disadvantages that you've seen? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, so definitely not a thousand a month. It's more like 30 a month, but it's been six years. <laughs> uh, we have a whole team that's doing it, not just me anymore. Um, technology uh, is not the only way to solve, you know, diversity within your organization. It's one tool you can use and you, it, it cannot exist by itself. Um, frankly, it's really a combination of where you source the talent from, uh, what technology you're leveraging to eliminate biases through the process, and then how you deal with the hiring manager at the end. Um, and so there's a, a number of different technologies. Uh, on the sourcing side, you have uh, job boards that are just focused on certain pools of candidates. You know, look at Fairy God Boss. This is uh, Glassdoor for Women, right? Uh, military Talent Group. You know, um, there, there's Jopwell, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to be thoughtful about where you source these candidates from and get the right people into the funnel. Uh, once you get them into the funnel, there's technology that helps you uh, eliminate bias from the resume, gaps in employment, removing names. Uh, I could tell you that your hiring managers are going to fight back on that one um, because they want to see that information. Uh, it makes their lives more difficult. Um, you know, but these technologies exist. Uh, there's, there's also, you know, technology uh, like assessments that can come in and say, hey, we don't care actually who this person is. We just care if they could do the job. Um, and so how and where you leverage these technologies in your process, you know, affect the, the positives or negatives that they bring. Um, you know, what are some of the positives where you eliminate, if you leverage, for example, an assessment, you eliminate some of the bias of the, that the people would bring to the equation. Um, but they're not perfect. I can tell you, I, I'm, you know, one of the predictions that I'm making for 2020 uh, is that there's um, a lot of noise around the validity of the assessments out in the space, and I think that uh, the bottom is going to fall out big time because I don't think many of them are valid, um, and so we'll see that what, what happens there. Um, you know, but, but I think that these tools can help you um, in making sure that you hire diverse talent. Right. And Kesa, can you tell us how Phenom People is leveraging specific tools, technology-wise, uh, to meet accessibility standards? Sure. <laughs> Back on. Um, uh, Phenom People, we are a uh, talent experience platform, and our focus is on the experience, whether that be candidate, um, end user, manager, recruiter, depending. 
And uh, a product that we just rolled out is Phenom Access, and that really puts into play the user. So when a user comes to the career site, is that no matter what type of user that is, and it's on our mission to find a billion people the right job, whether they be blind, any disability they have, each of our career sites now are accessible. So we're offering all of our our, our current clients uh, free accessibility audits. And as we continue into the future, Phenom Access is the platform that will make all of the career sites accessible. So it doesn't matter what type of disability you have. So that's what we're doing. Great. And so um, when we're looking actually at making sure that we're leveling the ability for everybody to be able to come in, Lois, how can people here, are there specific things that they can do to help underrepresented people, specifically those you know, with uh, neurodiverse um, challenges, to shine in a very competitive work environment? Absolutely. It's a really great question. <clears throat> one of the things I, um, actually, one of my clients just got placed in a really good firm. Um, they had a specific, a very specific, very um, noticeable as soon as they walk through the door disability. And um, one of the things I think of is I love stories. Stories, you now they've done studies that it retains memory, emotional recall, emotional connection. So what I work with my clients is something I call story selling. Using your stories to create value, educate your client, and close deals. So I have my candidates uh, put together, cobble together stories of how they are different and how they rock. And the first step is to look at job descriptions. Yes, there's the hard skills, but you want to look at the themes and soft skills. We're in a work environment. Soft skills are actually overriding um, hard skills. So are they looking for critical thinking? Are they looking for tenacity, self-study? So how do we cobble together stories that are a composite instead of saying, I'm a good thinker, I'm a this, the III syndrome, the stories, facts tell, stories sell. How do we put those stories together? And most people with disabilities have overcome them, or a lot of them, and that's what makes them a winning candidate. And why not play that up? Um, the other thing is with um, extracurricular activities. Maybe with learning challenges, you didn't get a high GPA, but you're a rock star with extracurriculars. How are you leveraging that? Um, I also feel like in the interview process, um, humor. One of my clients um, had a physical um, challenge, handicap, so one of the first lines I had uh, her work with is, I can help you with A, B, and C, but don't expect me to be on your softball team. And of course, the interviewer laughed. It, it sent a message, hey, I'm not playing the disability card, but I, can take my, I don't take myself so seriously. So I think all of those things, and to look at how can you knit those together and really show that the overcoming of your challenges is what's going to make you a winning candidate. Yeah, and I think it comes down to ruling people in. Find every way to try to rule people in rather than ruling them out. Because I think that we need to flip this script on that. Not, I want to touch on one specific part, and that's the underrepresented and minority narrative since we're talking about stories. So it's a ongoing story for people of color and all sorts of groups that were somehow underrepresented and minorities and I'm going to challenge the audience to not just take the view of it from work and what you've been told and really look at the numbers and look at the numbers not just for the US look at it globally there is nothing about a person that looks like me that is a minority at all in fact if you read up most economists will tell you by 2050 most of the world's economy will be focused in Africa and Asia who lives there right so I really want to kind of challenge us to start to change the narrative a bit about what is underrepresented and what's a minority. If you read most things, according to most, we've been at 13% African American since like the 60s. How is that possible? Right? Um, and when you think about affirmative action plans and how we have to self-identify, a lot of that is skewed, right? when we think about it, what is considered Caucasian and what is considered Asian and all this sort of thing. So um, not to take us too far off track, but I do think it's an important distinction for you as recruitment professionals and HR professionals to think about. So Janine, if you could just take it one step further and just tell us what are some opportunities that are tied to hiring neurodiverse candidates? 
they're some of your best employees, quite frankly. Um, if you can just find the work in the organization that is suited for their skill set. Um, so one of the things that I did working for um, Brookhaven National Laboratory was we had an instrumentation division and I had been doing quite a bit of work in the disability community, particularly around neurodiverse candidates. One of our claim to fame at that time was we can't hire them. They don't have bachelor's degrees, they don't have PhDs. Um, we can maybe offer them a tour or maybe we can offer them a short internship. And so I worked with them, I did that but I wasn't satisfied. I'm like, there's no way you can't tell me that we can't create something here where we can put them to work. I want an apprenticeship to work situation. And so we really sat down as a group, um, a, a multifunctional group and looked at the org chart and said, okay, what are, the, what are the barriers to entry in all of our divisions? And if there's a division, what is the one division where we could actually get people in without them having to have a bachelor's degree or a PhD and that the work would actually suit their skill set. And so it was instrumentation where they were basically focused on building things. It was pretty monotonous working in a shop, if you will. And so I went there, I looked around, I worked with the hiring manager. It turns out the hiring manager had some people that had Asperger's in their family. So they were sympathetic to what I was trying to do. And we really looked at, you know, what would they be doing? What was an apprenticeship look like? And what would that look like if we were to hire them? Um, unfortunately, the funding and all of that didn't go through for us to really see that through. But I think even where there's not opportunity, there's opportunity. You just have to be willing and actually care enough to create those pathways for somebody to have an opportunity. So I'm not of the opinion that there's any sort of like um, magic trick to this. I think that if you're in a place of power, if you're a person of influence or you care enough, I think you should find the advocates in the organization and the people that care enough like you to try to build alliances so that you can have that sort of thing happen. Okay, so I don't want to be the person who makes us all late for lunch. Yep. <laughs> Don't want to have that rep, but does anybody have a burning question that they would like to ask uh, the panelists at this time? Otherwise, yep. No, I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Joe. And last time we, we didn't do this, but we uh, we did it afterwards. But we're thanking everybody with the gift card for being. Thank you. Thank you so that, much. That Gen Z. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.